Hi guys, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Hockey on the Spot with Brandon Marinfeld. I'm Brandon Marinfeld. Thank you for joining me today. This is episode 115 of Hockey on the Spot. <clears throat> and today, continuing our playoff previews. This time, we are going to preview the Western Conference playoffs. Um, yesterday, I previewed the Eastern Conference playoffs. Today, I'm going to preview the West. But before I get into that... <laughs> Just want to give you an update. I hope you all catch the NHL 2014 NHL Draft Lottery uh, last night. <laughs> For those of you who didn't, um, the Florida Panthers would have won the first overall pick. Congratulations to them. This marks the third straight year in which the team with the highest chance of winning the first overall pick did not win the first overall pick. It was the Florida Panthers that would win <laughs> The draft lottery, the Buffalo Sabres, who were the worst team in the NHL and had the highest chances, will be picking second overall. Um, I mean, obviously not the position they want to be in, but you know they'll pro they'll hopefully get somebody good off of it. Um, Edmonton Oilers will pick third overall. The <laughs> Calgary Flames will pick fourth overall, and the New York Islanders will pick fifth overall. Um, so, um, again, congratulations to the Florida Panthers on winning the draft lottery. Um, obviously, three top players in this year's draft, and we don't know which yet. We don't know yet which one will be picked first overall. Samuel Bennett, Sam Reinhart, and Aaron Ekblad. It's very unclear which one of those guys will be picked first overall, but those will definitely be the top three picks. Um, Leon Dreisaitl, the German forward, may possibly squeeze in a, maybe one of those spots. But we'll see. It's going to be a very interesting draft this year. Anyway, now down to more important matters. Now time for my Western Conference playoff preview. Once again, the order I will be talking about each series will be by order of scheduling. And therefore, I will begin with the series between the Anaheim Ducks and the Dallas Stars. That is the first Western Conference matchup um, for in the playoffs to begin. That begins tonight. That will be the only Western Conference matchup tonight. The other three matchups begin tomorrow. For the Anaheim Ducks, <laughs> they had an absolutely phenomenal season. Um, their best regular season in franchise history. A record-setting 54 wins and a record-setting 116 points. <laughs> Obviously, uh, a team that's all, as always, led by the duo of Ryan Getzloff and Corey Perry, probably the best duo in the National Hockey League, the ideal duo in the National Hockey League. Now, um, obviously, it used to be the Sedin Twins, um, but obviously now they faded quite a lot this season under head coach John Tortorella, and of course they missed the playoffs. So, the Anna, Ryan Getzloff and Corey Berry, the best duo in the National Hockey League. Um, and Anaheim, obviously a big, strong team, a young team. One of the deepest, if not the deepest team in the National Hockey League. Um, um, they do not have a legitimate fourth-line center. They have a first-line center, a second-line center, and two third-line centers, effectively. So, that's basically a team with a lot of depth, a lot of strength on the back end, a much better back end than we've seen in years past, and the deepest goaltending tandem in the, in the NHL. They are in the best goaltending situation. Obviously, they had Victor Faust earlier in the year <laughs> before they dealt him to the Edmonton Oilers. They... Um, they still got Jonas Hiller, and then they got those two youngsters in Frederick Anderson and John Gibson. Um, John Gibson, of course, in the final week got his first three games of NHL experience and won all three. So it makes one think that maybe he, if both Hiller and Anderson do not do well in the playoffs, um, Gibson may get in a game or two. Um, but it's going to be a very interesting situation indeed. Um, in Anaheim, definitely an interesting situation and a good situation they want to be in. But in order, to, but and they have high expectations for their team this year. 
but they're going to have to go through an 8th place Dallas Stars team that did very well against them this season. The Dallas Stars won the season series this year, winning two out of the three meetings, and every game that they pretty much played against each other was pretty much in decisive fashion. <coughs> the Ducks would win the first meeting <coughs> by a 6-3 to three final score, but not before Dallas took a 3-1 to one lead. <laughs> Dallas would <coughs> rebound with a 6-3 to three victory of their own on their home ice against the Ducks. <coughs> and then the Ducks, the last game would, all, would be at the Honda Center, two games at the Honda Center, <coughs> with Dallas coming out on top in that game, 2 to nothing. The Dallas Stars also have a very good duo in the National Hockey League, and maybe the second best duo in the National Hockey League in Tyler Sagan and Jamie Benn. Tyler Sagan has had an unbelievable season. He's been he's one of the top scorers in the National Hockey League this season. He finished as the with the year with the fourth most points in the National Hockey League. Ryan Getzloff finished, of course, with the second most. But um, but uh. Tyler Sagan was a big surprise when he did not get named for the Canadian Olympic team. Um, and now he's looking like a player that's finally living up to his draft status um, after having a rough year last year with the Boston Bruins. And he's fit the system. He, he's fit the system that, Nil, that, Jim Nil, that Jim Nil wants to bring to Dallas. Um, and for a while, it did look like the Dallas Stars were pretty much out of it. They were not doing well at one point. But then they got hot at the right time. And obviously, a lot of the signings and acquisitions that they made have come up big for them this year. Tyler Sagan, obviously the biggest one. But Rich Peverly, before he went down with that stroke, um, <coughs> before he collapsed on the bench or the ice, um, he was playing very well. He's one of the... He is pretty much the ideal depth player in the National Hockey League. Um, Jamie Benn, obviously the captain of the Stars. He had a phenomenal season once again. And then, of course, you got that youngster, Valery Nachushkin, for out of Russia. A lot, he is projected to be the next Evgeny Malkin in the National Hockey League, and he definitely plays a Malkin-type style, a power style with great speed and great hands. Um... <coughs> And that's what the Dallas Stars are. They are a speed team. And that's what kind of got to the Ducks in the regular season series. And that's something that could be a bit of a problem for the Ducks this year, is that the Dallas Stars are one of the fastest teams in the National Hockey League. And they play at a high pace level. They move the puck quickly. They <laughs> get up, um, they get into the zone very quickly. And I think... <laughs> In order for the Ducks to really come out on top in this series <laughs> against the Dallas Stars team that really outplayed them this season, they're going to have to rely heavily on whichever goaltender is going to play for them, and whether it's Jonas Hiller or Frederick Anderson or John Gibson. It is being reported that Frederick Anderson is going to be the goaltender getting the start for Game 1. So in that case, he's going to have to be stellar. As for the forwards and defensemen, Obviously, on the back end, you always got to rely on Cam Fowler and, and Ben Lovejoy, their best tandem, but also Francois Beauchemin. They're going to rely on him to make a big open ice hit. But how about Stefan Robida, their trade deadline acquisition, now on the other side of the rivalry for the first time in his career? And with his age, wisdom, and experience, he could probably be a big help in this series and help the Ducks really beat up the Stars. And he knows what, how the Stars play. He knows their game plan. So you could bet that Stefan Robida is going to be informing the rest of his teammates how they play the game and how to stop them. So, um, <laughs> obviously, Robida's Dallas Stars outing, obviously not an ideal way to go out. Um, suffering an, a, a nasty injury that should have kept him out for the remainder of the year. He did... He did not get, and when he finally got healthy, he found himself in a Ducks uniform. So, not an ideal way to go out in Dallas, but obviously he's going to definitely want to repay them for that. He's 37 years of age, and to me, Stefan Robida is going to be a key player in that series, for the Ducks anyway. For the Stars, they'll definitely be relying on their goaltender, Kari Lettinen, 
Lettinen's going to have to be stellar. Um, this is only the second time in his career that he's made the playoffs. The only other time was in 2007 with the old Atlanta Thrashers, and they got swept swept that year by the New York Rangers. So, <laughs> Lettinen, not a playoff goaltender, not a proven playoff goaltender, had one of his best regular seasons ever. Um, but the Stars are definitely a team that are capable of a Cinderella run because just solely because of that speed. And obviously they have a good back end. They have Sergei Gonchar, who brings the wisdom back there. Um, Brendan Dillon, he's becoming an ideal blue liner in the National Hockey League, a great two-way blue liner, a fine young defenseman. He'll be a good defenseman for them for years to come. Um, <laughs> I, think the, I think it's going to be a very close series. Um, I really do. I think I could see maybe six, seven games. I'll say six. But at the end of the day, I still think that despite the fact that the Ducks have, were outplayed by the Stars in the, play, in the season series, the Stars do not have the kind of experience that the Ducks have in the playoffs. This is their first time in the playoffs since 2008. And really, the only guy on that team with... <coughs> Uh, with, you know, the only two guys on that team with any cup experience at all are Tyler Sagan, who won it in his rookie year, and Sergey Gonchar. They really don't have any other players who have a cup up. I, well, I believe Alex Goligoski, he, yeah, Alex Goligoski has a cup as well, actually. But um, they're not a very well-experienced team. They're not adjusted to playoff hockey. It's been a long time since the team has been in the playoffs, and they have completely different players, a completely different makeover from the last Dallas team that made the playoffs. So as far as where, what I think this series is going to go, I think it'll be a six-game series, but I, I still think at the end of the day, the Ducks' playoff experience and Stefan Robidon now being on the other side is going to make it possible for the Ducks to win this series in six games. <laughs> Now, moving on to our next series, we go to the St. Louis Blues and the Chicago Blackhawks. For the, for the St. Louis Blues, obviously, an unbelievable season for them. They finished off the year with 111 points and 52 wins. <coughs> um, and for them, things only seemed to get better when they made a, arguably the biggest trade near the trade deadline acquiring Ryan Miller and Steve Ott from the Buffalo Sabres in exchange for Chris Stewart, Yaroslav Halak, a prospect, and a first-round pick. Um, Halak obviously was then traded to the Washington Capitals shortly after. Chris Stewart was going to be traded, but as of now, he is still a Buffalo Sabre. But the St. Louis Blues, another team that's very deep. However... Misfortune has struck in St. Louis. <laughs> they were doing so well at one point, and it looked, and at one point it looked like with Ryan Miller on the team that they were unbeatable. But then, unfortunately, injuries started to strike the St. Louis Blues, and not just to simple little players. We're talking about their core here. They've lost core players to injuries and at the wrong time, and in result. Ryan Miller hasn't looked as good as he we know him to be, and the Blues look, ended the season with a six-game losing streak. And after having such a huge lead, not only on the Central Division, but also in the Western Conference, they looked like they had the Western Conference locked, but that six-game losing streak really hurt them. And not only did they lose the West, but they also lost the Central Division on the final day. The Colorado Avalanche would be the team that would sneak it away from them. Hard to believe. Really a stunning situation to be in. You never want to be in that situation. And so now the Blues go into the playoffs after being the first really after being the first team in the NHL to clinch the playoffs. They now go into the playoffs now third in the Western Conference instead of first or second. <laughs> and they go in on a six-game losing streak, and they go in on injuries, which is going to be a big concern in St. Louis. It really is. And a lot of people, including myself, have picked the Blues to win the Stanley Cup this season. Um, I'm still pretty confident that they can do it, but now it's going to be much harder for them to do it. And now, 
especially considering now they're going up against a Chicago Blackhawks team that's not only going to have jo both Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane back for Game 1, but they they won the Stanley Cup last year. Joel Quenville, Joel Quenville all, as always, one of the ideal coaches in the National Hockey League. And they're still a young team, they're still a fast team, and they're the top scoring team in the National Hockey League. At the end of the season, no team scored more goals in the NHL this season than the Chicago Blackhawks. They finished the, NA the season with one more goal than the Anaheim Ducks. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> for the Chicago Blackhawks, their offense is just beyond belief incredible. And not to mention Duncan Keith... Probably the ideal defenseman in the NHL this year. you could got to figure that he'll probably win the Norris Trophy and then Corey Crawford having a stellar season as well. So, <laughs> for the Chicago Blackhawks, again, it hasn't been the same kind of year that we've seen from them in years past. I mean, they started out as one of the best teams in the league. They went on a landslide for a little while, <laughs> and that is why they finished fifth in the, in the Eastern Conference rather than somewhere like first or second. Um, but the, the good news for the Blues is that they won the season series against Chicago this year. Um, the, the Blackhawks had a real hard time playing against them this year. The Blues won that series, winning three out of the five meetings. The bad news is that the, the, the three meetings that the Blues won were all the first three meetings of the season. The Blackhawks won the last two. And that includes the most recent additions of the two rosters. And that could pose as a problem for the Blues. Even though they won the season series overall, the fact that the Blackhawks not only won the last two, but won <laughs> with the most recent additions of both rosters, that could be a bit of a concern for the Blues going into this series. Um, the Blackhawks... They're ready to go for the playoffs. Again, they were without both Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane for the rest of the season. They'll both be back for Game 1. But at the same time, it also allowed for, a, for a, other youngsters to step up and also allowed for someone new to take the scoring title for the team this season. Patrick Sharp ends the year as the team's scoring leader this season, one point ahead of Patrick Kane. So... Um, congrats to Patrick Sharp. He was without question their most consistent player when those two went down with injuries. Um, you know, and they've had youngsters come in and step up, and it's allowed for a youngster like Jeremy Morant to, or Morin to come in and become a factor, and he's looking like a second-line center, that the second-line center that they've been missing all season long. That was the one thing the Hawks were missing all season long, a true second-line center. They thought it was going to be Brandon Peary, but he struggled in Chicago. They traded him to the Florida Panthers, and now he's playing great. Um, <clears throat> but now they get Jeremy Morant, Morin in there, <laughs> and he's been brilliant. So Jeremy Morin playing some great hockey. And he is a he is gonna be a, he is gonna be a good player for them, and he could end up being their second line center for the next couple of years. Um, now, again, we're gonna have a very interesting goalie matchup in Ryan Miller and Corey Crawford. And really, when you look at this series, you look at the two goaltenders. Both goaltenders are gonna have to be great, especially Ryan Miller. Ryan Miller again did not play well down the final stretch. Um, when it comes playoff time, though, it's, uh, it's believed that he can be a much different player. Um, although the last couple of years he's been in the playoffs, he's been eliminated in the first round. Um, so for Miller, obviously for Miller, he's going to hope to rectify this, and he wants to have a good series. He wants to be the domination of the series, and the Blues, obviously, like any team, are going to look for the sweep here. But... <laughs> They're going to have to do it with a bit of a crippled roster. They lost their core to injuries now, so that's going to be a big problem for them. Now you entrust guys like Jaden Schwartz to step up. Um, you're going to have Patrick Berglund. He's another guy who definitely needs to step up. Um, Alexander Steen, he's going to have to step up. He's had a career year. Um, but And the Blues are just going to have to get healthy. They may be without their captain, David Backus. 
<laughs> for a little bit. We'll see. It's going to be an interesting situation in St. Louis. For the Blackhawks, they have both Kane and Taves coming fresh off of injury. And there, we you could expect that neither one of those two is going to show any sign of la uh, any sign of players just coming back into the game. Um, they have the playoff experience necessary to dominate the game. They both have two cups, and Kane and both each have a Conn Smythe Trophy, and Kane in particular has a Stanley Cup winning goal. So back in 2010. <laughs> so. Who do I see winning this series and how many games? Again, I did predict the Blues to win the Stanley Cup this year, and I. Now, the big question is am I going to stick with that statement? Considering the injuries and considering Ryan Miller's poor play as of late, that makes things a little bit. my decision a little bit harder. Um, it's going to be a very hard decision for me to make. I think, you know, the Blackhawks, just given their experience and given their speed and their ability to make plays and get the puck to each other, it's going to make life very difficult. You know, they also have Marion Hossa in there, too. Forgot to mention him. Um, it's going to make life difficult for the Blues. I, I really, it's really going to be a hard decision, but... I'll stick with the Blues. I'm, I'm going to stick with them, but I'm also having my doubts. I think it'll be a very good series. This is a big rivalry in the NHL. I th um, those two really at each other's throats whenever they play each other. Um, so realistically, you know, I'm going to stick with the Blues here, but I have my doubts. I'm going to say seven games, um, but once again, I have my doubts. I'm only saying seven games because I think the Hawks are going to give them a really rough ride. So, I'll, again, I'm very optimistic. The other part of me is saying Hawks in five games, but <laughs> I'll stick with the Blues, say seven games, but I'm very optimistic about it. I really am. Okay, now we move on to our next playoff series. <laughs> Scheduled, the Colorado Avalanche and the Minnesota Wild. Where the heck did this Colorado team come from? That's really the big question on everybody's mind this season. Going from dead last place in the Western Conference and second to last in the, in the league overall last year <laughs> to, be, to being the third best team, the second best team in the Western Conference and the third best team in the league overall this year. It's unbelievable, it's shocking, and something that just doesn't happen. I stressed this out a couple days ago. Again, the big coaching change, bringing Patrick Waugh in, a great player and a Hall of Fame goaltender coming in being a head coach. Obviously something that usually doesn't work out, but it's worked out this year. Joe Sackett coming into the front office as well as the president and GM and he has just been marvelous as well. And obviously the big key for the Avalanche was winning the draft lottery over the Florida Panthers and selecting Nathan McKinnon with the first overall pick. Nathan McKinnon, without question, was the top rookie in the National Hockey League this year. He will win the Calder Trophy for Rookie of the Year, without a doubt. Um, and he, he really showed his showed that he's going to probably be a great player in the National Hockey League. Matt Duchesne, it was a great year for him, and it on pace to a career year up until the injury. Um, they may not have him back until the second round, actually. They're probably not going to have him back until the second round. So we'll see how that works out. <laughs> um, and as far as the Avalanche are concerned, though, they still got a huge amount of depth up front. They got... Again, Paul Stastny, they got Ryan O'Reilly, they got Nathan McKinnon, they got Gabriel Landeskog, their captain. They got P.A. Parento back healthy. Um, they got a lot on offense, they really do. They got Max Talbot, a guy with playoff experience. Um, they got him in a mid-season trade with the Flyers, sending Steve Downey the other way. And Talbot's definitely been the better of the two, uh, without question. Talbot's been great since coming over. The Avalanche... They have a good team right now, and like the Dallas Stars, they are their game is all about speed. 
They are a speed team. They are a young team, and they like to go to the net. That's that's how the Avalanche play. That's how Patrick Waugh plays his team, coaches his team. He likes a fast-paced speed team that can move the puck well and crash the net, um, as well as maybe deke out the goaltender a little bit. Um, and the Avalanche definitely have a lot of those guys who go to the net and can fake out goaltenders. They have a lot of guys who know how to deke the puck well. Um, and then, of course, you got the net crashers like Gabriel Landeskog, like Ryan O'Reilly, who's like a poor, who's pretty much a poor man's Patrice Bergeron. Um, you know, Paul Stastny is a guy who makes plays. Matt Duchesne is a guy. Matt Duchesne is a guy who could do it all. That's of course will come when he's healthy. He crashes the net and makes plays and scores goals. And then of course you got the youngster and Nathan McKinnon, who's also a guy who pretty much does it all. Um, so very interesting situation indeed um, for the Colorado Avalanche. Um, they got a lot of good forwards. And then of course you got defense. Um, Tyson Berry has had a very incredible season this year. He's starting to look like the defenseman they think he's going to become. But the big concern now is can he get back in the lineup? He got injured just before the season ended, um, and the, there is a slight possibility that it could be season ending. Um, so we will see. It's going to be very interesting. Um, hope both Duchesne and Berry get back healthy. They called Stefan Elliott up from the Lake Erie Monsters. He hasn't played all year except for that last game of the year. But you can anticipate one could anticipate that he'll play until Barry comes back, or even until Corey Sarich comes back. He is a guy who they got in the off season from the Calgary Flames that they hope to have back because he played well when he came over. He's a shutdown defenseman, and that was really the big concern for the Avalanche this year going in. How is their defense going to hold up? We all thought that it was going to come crashing down, but it has not been the case at all. We talk about Tyson Berry having a career year. How about Eric Johnson, the first overall pick from 2006? He looks like he's, after all these years, finally becoming the player that everyone projected him to be. He's played some great hockey this year on the back end. Um, Andre Benoit, their free agent signing from the Ottawa Senators, He's had a big year coming in, stepping up. Um, Andre Benoit has been a blessing in the skies for them. He's been one of their better two-way defensemen. He's mostly a shutdown defenseman, but we constant, you can constantly see him at the point on the power play. He's got a big shot from the point, even though he doesn't score all that much. Um, but yeah, and then, of course, how about Nick Holden, a guy who nobody had ever heard of going into the season. He they got him from the Columbus Blue Jackets. He only had about three or four games of NHL experience with them, and he comes in for the Colorado Avalanche, and he's one of their top goal-scoring defensemen this year. Um, the Colorado defense, actually, in general, one of the top goal-scoring defense cores in the NHL because of Barry and Holden and Eric Johnson. Um, Nick Holden, he's another power play quarterback with a big shot from the point. And then, of course, they also got Nate Gennon, a 30-year-old who was never able to stabilize a spot on any NHL roster until this season with the Avalanche. The Avalanche totally turned him into an NHL player and a shutdown defenseman. He's found his role in the National Hockey League, and now the defense is holding up. And how can you talk about the Colorado Avalanche without talking about the real superstar of their team this season, their goaltender, Simeon Varlamov. It's been a breakout year for Varlamov, a career year, and, <laughs> and a record-setting year. Um, Patrick Waugh going into the season was the only Colorado defenseman ever to s obtain 40 wins, and it was 40 wins on the dot. <laughs> for um, Simeon Varlamov, he breaks Patrick Waugh's avalanche record for most wins in the season. He got 41 wins this year, and he didn't play the last couple games because they wanted to rest him for the playoffs. And now Varlamov is ready for the playoffs. <laughs> We've seen it with the Washington Capitals that this is a goaltender who can thrive very well in the playoffs. He came in, remembering back in 2009, in the first round series against the New York Rangers, he came in in relief of Jose Theodore and totally changed that series around. And the Capitals went on to win that series in seven games, coming back 3-1 down. So Varlamov, you know, he knows how to thrive in a in 
playoff situations, he knows how to play very well in the playoffs. So now, well, now that he's developed his regular season game at long last, <coughs> one could anticipate, <laughs> one could anticipate that Varlamov is going to be a a playoff ready goaltender this season. <laughs> and for the for the Avalanche, they go up against the rival team, the Minnesota Wild. Um, <laughs> who is a team who holds a lot of experience, and they had a great year this season. Um, they had a great year this season. Zach Parise, great season for him. He's a guy with playoff experience. Um, he led the New Jersey Devils to the Stanley Cup Finals back in 2012. Um, so he's a guy who knows how to get there. And then, of course, they got Ryan Suter on the back end. He's probably He is probably the best defenseman on their team and now can probably argue as one of the better defensemen in the over in the National Hockey League overall. Um, the <laughs> Wild also have a very young team, um, a team that likes to really play more of a defensive style, but at the same time they rush the puck and score. They rush the puck and score goals. And then they also have Jason Pominville <laughs> on their offense as well. And what a year it was for him. The top leading scorer for the Minnesota Wild this season. This guy is a pure sniper. Um, he sh likes to shoot the puck, especially on the half wall. So, <laughs> um, big year <laughs> for Jason Pominville. Big year for Zach Parise. Miko Koivu had a pretty strong year when he was healthy. He only had 11 goals, but he had 43 assists to make up for it. This is a playmaker. Without This is a playmaker for sure. But the, Av but the Wild... Outside of Parise and Koivu and Suter and Pominville, <laughs> that's which is really their core four. They don't have a lot in the way of experience. They got Michael Granlin, who you know he's a young kid. Nino Niederreiter is a youngster. Charlie Coyle's a youngster. Um, <laughs> you know they got Danny Heatley on their team, but we all know he's not the same Danny Heatley that he used to be. But he is a guy who's been to the Stanley Cup Finals before. He's got playoff experience. That's why he's there, and that's why he'll be in the lineup. Now, will he play well in the playoffs? I doubt it, as again, he is not the same Danny Heatley that he used to be, but he at least can bring the experience. They got Matt Cook, who also has experience. He actually has a Stanley Cup on his resume um, with the Pittsburgh Penguins, so they'll rely on him heavily in the playoffs. But outside of those guys, again, again, Gramlin and Niederreiter and Coyle, they're all young kids. They are all kids, and they don't have They don't have the kind of experience the other guys have. And for Gramlin, he missed the last half month of the season. They hope to have him back for the playoffs. Um, they hope to have him back for Game One. <laughs> But, again, this is just not a team that has a lot of depth or experience. Okay, they maybe they, they have, their depth is getting <laughs> is a little better. And, obviously, they got Matt Molson from the trade, at the trade deadline from the Buffalo Sabres. But, you know, he, has to, he doesn't really have much playoff experience at all. He made it to the playoffs last season with the Islanders, but they got eliminated in the first round. So... <laughs> there, there's that situation, and then you talk. Then you got to look at uh, the wild situation in goal. Josh Harding is no, is probably gone for the rest of the season with multiple sclerosis. Nicholas Backstrom, he's got probably gone for the rest of the year, and even when he was healthy, he wasn't playing well. So now you got to rely on Darcy Kemper and Ilya Brzgalov. um who have both come in and played very well. Kemper's had a good rookie season this year. Um, although he lost his last few games. But Ilya Brzgalov coming in has really been the big story for the Wild. He came in late in the season, joined the Edmonton Oilers, really wasn't playing all that great for him. He now then comes into the Minnesota Wild, and he just dominates. He's looked like a totally different Ilya Brzgalov, like, kind of like the one we saw when he was with the Phoenix Coyotes. Um, he's... <laughs> Been tremendous when he came, went, since coming over to the Wild, and one could expect that for Game One, Brzgalov will probably get the start for the Wild. But um, but this Wild team lack of experience and the depth isn't all that experience right now. They're going to be a very deep team in the coming years, <laughs> but they're not there yet. They are not 
they are totally not there yet. Um, they have a lot of youngsters on their team. They're very young, and you know they do play a grinding style, uh, an in-your-face type of style. But most of their success this season has come on home ice. On the road, they've been mediocre. They've been below average at best. Um, and that could really be the killer for the Wild because they are the seventh seed going up against an Avalanche team that did win the season series against the Wild this season. Um, they won, <laughs> yes, they won the season series against the Wild this year. I'm pretty sure the Wild only won one game, one or two games. Um, yeah, one game, I believe. And that's going to be the downfall <laughs> for the Wild. You know, for me, honestly, if talking about the Avalanche, per, for me personally, if the Avalanche are going up against anybody else, I'd probably say they're not that experienced and they need more playoff experience before they're ready to go far. However, the Minnesota Wild team, this Minnesota team, they're not that deep and <laughs> they're very young. And even though they may have a little bit more playoff experience than the Avalanche as far as players go, for the Avalanche, all they really got is Max Talbot. Um, they really don't have much in the way of playoff experience at all. Um, they don't have too many guys that have been there, done that. But they just have a better, well-rounded team. And that is why I think it will be the Avalanche coming out on top over the Wild. However, because the Wild do have that Stanley Cup experience, I do think it's going to be... I don't think it's going to be a blowout... <laughs> I think it. I think we're talking about a six-game series here. Or we're talking about a six-game series here, but I still think at the end of the day that the Colorado Avalanche will win that series, four games to two. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, our final Western Conference series and our final playoff series overall: the San Jose Sharks and the Los Angeles Ki Los Angeles Kings, the Battle of California. <laughs> um. We're talking about two teams that absolutely despise each other. <coughs> that absolutely despise each other. And for the Sharks, they were one of the hottest teams in the National Hockey League when the season began. When the, they began the season with a nine-game point streak, they actually began the year 8-0-1. So uh, that was big for the Sharks. Um, but then they collapsed for a little while, um, you know, and they lost Thomas Hurdle. For the longest time, he was proving to be a great rookie before he got hurt. Now, obviously, Hurdle back, back now. He came back toward the end of the season, and he's ready to go for the playoffs. Um, probably would have been up there as a Calder Trophy candidate had he not gotten hurt. So <laughs> that was a huge loss for the Sharks. But but you, I, I do have to admit, <laughs> this is a really deep Sharks team this year. This the deepest I personally have seen them in years. <coughs> um, they got Joe Thornton. They got Patrick Marlowe. They got Logan Couture. They got Joe Pavelski, who finished the year with 41 goals. He was one of the top scorers in the NHL this season. It was a breakout year for Joe, for Joe Pavelski. Um, Brent Burns, who has the, first, the versatility to switch from defenseman to forward, um, he's their most versatile player, and coming up to forward, he's been a great player for them. They got Dan Boyle on the back end, and even though he's 37 years of age, we all know very well he can still play the game. Um, he'll be an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year, though, and it's looking more and more like he might not come back to the Sharks um, because he did not sign with them. And The Sharks do want to extend him, but we'll see what happens. We'll, we will see what happens. He may look to embrace a new challenge. Um, but um, they got Justin Braun back there. He's becoming a fine defenseman in the NHL. Jason Demers as well. Mark Edward Vlasic, the representative for, for Team Canada, like Patrick Marlowe. Gold medalist, um, Patrick Marlowe, a double gold. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is a really deep Sharks team. Even they got a little bit of experience with Adam Burrish there. Um you know, that this is a team, they have experience and they have guys who have really stepped up this year 
And then, of course, you always can't. You gotta always talk about the goaltender, Antti Niemi. He will he will be in the conversation for the possibly the Vesna Trophy this year. He was without a doubt one of the best goalies this year, just like Tuka Rask and Simeon Varlamov. Um, but um, <laughs> but um, Varlamov actually may be in the conversation for a Hart Trophy as well. <laughs> Speaking of which, but going back to the Sharks, Niemi. He was quite argu- He was also. He was one of the team's MVPs this year. I think the real team MVP would probably be Joe Pavelski, but um, but Niemi has really helped to get things done in San Jose, and they had a great season once again. And they came this close, this close from stealing the Pacific Division from the Anaheim Ducks and possibly even the Western Conference from the St. Louis Blues at the time of the Sharks leading the division. But the Ducks obviously stole it back, and the Ducks went on to win first place in the Western Conference um, for the first time in their franchise history, and one point <coughs> behind the Boston Bruins for the President's Trophy. But go, but anyway, for the San Jose Sharks, um, they have a very deep team this year, and they... You know, after all these years of misery in the playoffs, that's always been the talk year in and year out. Always one of the best teams in the regular season. And Todd McClellan, always one of the best coaches in the regular season. But they can never get it done in the playoffs. That's just it. They can never get it done in the playoffs. They've gone as far as the Western Conference Finals twice, and both times they got killed. The first year they got swept by the Chicago Blackhawks, and the following year they lost in five games to the Vancouver Canucks. So this is a team that just can't seem to get it done in the playoffs. They really just lose it in the playoffs, and that's going to be a factor <coughs> for the Sharks in the series. The Los Angeles Kings know that, and the Sharks, of course, they will have home ice advantage in this series, but they're going up against a Los Angeles Kings that has just as much, if not more, Stanley Cup experience than the Chicago Blackhawks. Even though they're two years removed from their cup, whereas the Hawks are one year removed, the Kings really didn't lose anybody over the offseason. They got Andre Kopitar. They got Mike Richards. They got their captain, Dustin Brown. They got Jeff Carter, who's always one of the deadliest snipers in the National Hockey League. They got Justin Williams, who becomes a totally different player in the playoffs. And they got a good... Core of youngster, they have a good youngster this year in Tyler Toffoli, um, and then of course how, Dwight King and Jordan Nolan. They were on that Cup team. Um, they got a lot of Cup experience this year, due to the Los Angeles Kings. And you got to figure that they'll be in the conversation to possibly go on a Cinderella run. They got Matt Green on their back end. They got Willie Mitchell on their back end. <coughs> More Cup experience there. Um, you know, they, they got Slava Voinov back there. They got Drew Doughty back there. And they got Robin Regeer back there as well. He's pretty much he pretty much took over the role that Rob Scuderi was filling when they acquired him from the Buffalo Sabres a year ago. Um, and Robin Regeer has been a fine addition for the team. But they are absolutely loaded. Are you kidding me? with this Los Angeles defense and that offense as well, and the forwards as well. And then Jonathan Quick as your starting goaltender. Are you kidding me? That's 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 a loaded Kings roster right there. <laughs> um, and they can definitely give the, King, the Sharks a big problem. And Martin Jones, one of the premier backup goaltenders in the league this year, one of the premier rookie goaltenders, <laughs> in the league this year. And then, of course, at the trade deadline, the Kings made one trade, acquiring Marion Gabrick from the Columbus Blue Jackets. And ever since he's come along, he's been playing some good hockey for them. They'll, you can expect, one could expect that they'll be talking about a possible contract extension for him. There's a possibility that they want to keep him in L.A. Um, will he stay in L.A.? Who knows? He's an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. But Gabrick has looked like the old Marion Gabrick fitting under Daryl Sutter's system. Really the big problem for the Los Angeles Kings all season long was their inability to score goals. And at one point, they went on this really long losing streak where they could only get one goal a game at the most, maybe two, but they would lose these games and they were out of the playoff picture for a while. They then started playing well again, 
But this is a team that does have a problem scoring goals, and that's something the Sharks are going to hope to exploit. However, the Kings obviously very strong defensively. And the other problem that's been the other big problem for the Kings <coughs> throughout the years has been their inability to win a game at the Shark Tank. Um, the Shark Tank has been a miserable place for the Kings to play over recent years. They finally won a game at the Shark Tank this year. That was a one nothing final score. And the Kings actually went on to win the season series this year. But it was a close season series at the same time. It was only three games. To, they only won three out of five. And, this, and it was a much closer season series than it looked. There was only one blowout game, and that was the Kings' 4-1 to one victory. Um, there were a couple shootouts between the two this year. So we could expect probably one of the most exciting... Se what can we expect from this series? Probably one of the most exciting, if not the most exciting series in the overall playoffs this year. The rivalry between these two teams is just... <coughs> is huge. Um, you know, <laughs> but as far as my prediction for this series goes, despite the fact that the Sharks have home ice advantage and they got all that depth, and, you know, despite the fact that the Kings have struggles playing in San Jose, I do think they will be able to steal a game in San Jose, and uh, <laughs> I do believe in their ability to steal a game in San Jose and win every game on home ice. I see a seven-game series here. And I see, the, but I in the end, at the end of the day, I think the Kings Stanley Cup experience is going to be way too much for the Sharks to handle. So I see the LA Kings coming out on top in seven games. <laughs> um, it's going to be a very close series, and some I think at the end of it, it's going to come down to someone being the hero in Game Seven, which could really go either way. But I really at the mo most. At the end of the day, <laughs> see it being the Kings coming out on top <laughs> in the series in seven games. And overall, what makes the Western Conference playoff playoffs different from the Eastern Conference playoffs? For the East, even though every single matchup is a divisional is an interdivisional matchup, whereas the West has one non-divisional matchup in the Anaheim Ducks and Dallas Stars. <laughs> The rivalries in the Western Conference matchups this year are much more intense than what we've seen in the East. <coughs> For the East, the only real big rivalry in the Eastern Conference playoffs this year is the series of the New York Rangers and the Philadelphia Flyers. That's a big rivalry right there. But every other series really doesn't pos possess a big rivalry. You have the Boston Bruins and the Detroit Red Wings. Yeah, it's an original six matchup. But they haven't been rivals in many, many, many years. It's been a very long time since they've been rivals. They were rivals at one time, but it's been over 30 years <laughs> since that has been the case. They haven't played a playoff series against each other in that amount of time. <laughs> and, you know, they're really just rebuilding the rivalry now. So Boston-Detroit, it's not a really well-developed rivalry just yet. Um, you know, this playoff series could obviously change that, but, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> they're not huge rivals yet. <laughs> Pittsburgh Penguins and Columbus Blue Jackets, same thing. Even though they're now in the same division, the Blue Jackets have spent their entire franchise in the Western Conference up until this year. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and even now, they're not really big rivals at all. They really don't have... <laughs> players that play for each other's teams, they it's not like they have a lot of players that play for each other's teams. Really, if I, if, uh, you know, only Mark Letestu has played for both teams. Mark Letestu of the Blue Jackets has played for both teams, and he's really the only one. Um, but other than that, that's about it. <laughs> you know, they're not big rivals at all, and the Blue Jackets know they're outmatched, and that's why it's not a big rivalry. <laughs> And then the Tampa Bay Lightning and Montreal Canadiens, once again, even though they're in the same division now, we're talking Florida versus Canada. Doesn't mesh well as far as a rivalry goes. Um, I mean, obviously, these series can make them rivals if something bad does happen. But, you know, it's not a big rivalry. It really isn't. <laughs> the Lightning and Canadians have really never been out for each other's guts. 
It's never come down to that. And so, you know, we don't really have too much, much in the way of rivalries in the Eastern Conference. Again, only the New York Rangers and Philadelphia Flyers are really big rivals in this year's Eastern Conference playoffs. Whereas in the West, every single matchup is a rivalry matchup. <laughs> you have the Chicago Blackhawks and the St. Louis Blues. They've been big rivals since day one. <laughs> you know, and since Chicago and, you know, Illinois and Missouri are literally next door, you know, that, that, that this is a big rivalry we're talking about here between the Blues and the Hawks. The Avalanche, the Colorado Avalanche and Minnesota Wild, maybe the big, the rival, the, the least, you know, the least hated rivalry in this series, but a rivalry nonetheless. They've been in each other's division since the Wild broke out into the league, since we had the, for, the sixth division format. They were both in the Northwest division together, and they were both the only two American teams in that division. And because of that, they battled for which one was better. You know, Minnesota-Colorado, so they have a pretty big rivalry, and they also have playoff history with each other. So they played each other twice in the playoffs, actually. This is the third time. And so, yeah, they hate each other. They hate each other. They don't like each other. <laughs> they don't like each other at all. Then you got the San Jose Sharks and the Los Angeles Kings. Need I say more? Two California teams. Need I say more? That's pretty self-explanatory right there. They hate each other. They absolutely hate each other. And then finally, you got the Anaheim Ducks and the Dallas Stars. The only non-divisional matchup in either one in either playoff in either playoff bracket. However, the Dallas Stars used to be in the division with the Ducks, and that has carried over. And now they're in a playoff series together. They may not see each other as much, but these teams still have blood for each other. You know, they haven't forgotten anything that's happened, any of the history that's happened between the two. <coughs> You know, Mike Madonna was always a constant threat against the Ducks. He's the biggest Duck villain of all time. And the Ducks will never forget that, you know. You know, obviously there was that brawl back in 1998. That will never be forgotten. And even the, again, even though they're in different divisions, they are still rivals. They are still very much rivals. They absolutely hate each other. They can't stand each other, the Ducks and the Stars, you know. And so both of them will be out for each other. And they'll both look to, for a big series as well. So, the Western Conference playoffs, you could tell in this first round, is going to be a ten times more competitive than the Eastern Conference this year for sure. <coughs> going to be a very interesting playoffs, folks. Going to be a very, very interesting playoffs this year. A um, couple of updates before we wrap this up. <laughs> up, Derek Broussard gets injured in a Rangers practice yesterday, but is anticipated to play in Game 1. Steve Mason, um, it's very unclear if Steve Mason's going to play. Um, he's uncertain to go for Game 1, in which case Ray Emery will probably be the start <coughs> starter. The Philadelphia Flyers called up Cal Heater to take over Mason's spot until he returns. He's one of their top prospects. Um, you know, Henrik Zetterberg, he could... Um, he's shooting for a comeback, but it probably won't be until the second round. Same situation for Chris Kreider. Matthew Shane probably won't be back till the second round <laughs> and for the Avalanche. Um, <laughs> and finally, both Michael Granlin and Darcy Kemper were at practice for the Wild yesterday, and both could be ready to go <laughs> for, for Game 1. Um, John Curry was acting as the backup to Ilya Brzgalov in Kemper's absence. Um, so, those are your little updates for today. Get ready, folks, because the, the, the 2014 Stanley Cup playoffs begin tonight. So be sure to catch that. The first game of tonight, the game to open up the playoffs <laughs> off tonight, <laughs> will be a CNBC broadcast <laughs> as the Montreal Canadiens and the Tampa Bay Lightning at the Tampa Bay type Times Forum. That will open up at 7 o'clock. Then at 7.30, we'll have the Columbus Blue Jackets and the Pittsburgh Penguins at the uh, Consul Energy Center. That will be, that game one will start. And then also, and then at 10 o'clock on NBC Sports Network, 
will be the first Western Conference playoff matchup, matchup between the Dallas Stars and the Anaheim Ducks at the Honda Center. Um, <laughs> um, Philadelphia Flyers and New York Rangers will start their series at Madison Square Garden tomorrow. Um, the Chicago Blackhawks and St. Louis Blues will start their series tomorrow at the Scott Trade Center. The Minnesota Wild and Colorado Avalanche will start their series tomorrow at the Pepsi Center. And the Los Angeles Kings and San Jose Sharks will start their playoff series tomorrow at the SAP Center, a.k.a. the Shark Tank. And then the Boston Bruins, the Detroit Red Wings, and the Boston Bruins will not start their series until Friday. That will be the last playoff series to begin. Game 1 of that series will begin on Friday at the TD Bank North Garden, or the TD Garden, <coughs> at at the TD Garden. So that will look, so we'll look for that series to begin. But yeah, folks, the Stanley Cup playoffs have arrived, and it's going to be a very exciting time. And once again, congratulations to the Florida Panthers for winning the 2014 NHL Draft Lottery. Uh, just want to bring that up once again before we cut out. <laughs> um... And good news for the Pittsburgh Penguins, they could have Evgeny Malkin back for Game 1 um, as well. And that will do it, folks. Again, be sure to catch the playoffs tonight. Right. This is all for all the marbles now, folks. The Stanley Cup is the ultimate prize, and it all begins tonight. So be sure to check it out. It's going to be very exciting. All right, folks. I will probably won't do another video again until... Um, after the first round is over, or at some point midway through the first round. I don't know. I might do a video Monday. I might not. Um, if anything, I definitely will do my next video, if anything, after the first round is over. So enjoy the playoffs, everybody. Enjoy it. It's a fun time. This is the perfect time to get into hockey right now. So until then, thank you for watching my Western Conference <laughs> playoff preview um until then um that and this has been episode 115 of hockey on the spot thank you guys for joining me today this has been <laughs> this has been hockey on the spot with brandon barenfeld i'm brandon barenfeld i will see you guys soon thank you have a great day and enjoy the playoffs